Welcome back to another edition of Light Beer, Dark Money. I am your humble host, Chris Clements, and sitting next to me is not Sean Noble. Because Sean is away on a little excursion with his family, and I hope he's doing great. This is Lisa James, the legendary Lisa James, the Gordon C. James uh, PR agency here in town. And Lisa and I have known each other for 20-something years, perhaps. We'll just go with that. Like a long time. Like a really long time. And she was gracious enough to come in today as Sean is on on assignment. On assignment? I'll, I'll put, is that I'll what put we're it calling that way. It? Yeah, we'll call it on assignment because he was going to Washington, D.C., so I can only assume it has something to do with dark money. There you go. Because if it wasn't for Sean, the dark money, the whole term would never exist. You might be right. Yeah, absolutely. But um, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks How have for you been? having me. I'm, I'm good. You've been busy. You've had a couple guests come on our show. You've been I, feeding us people. I, I And I appreciate you having them on your show. Well, I, think I, mean, they've, great. I think they've been good shows. Yeah, we, uh, we had uh, William Hay on a, yes. a couple weeks ago. He was fantastic. I, they are doing such good work there. So I at appreciate Skettle, you spreading the word. Over yes. at ASU. Yes. Who knew that ASU could actually be doing good work? Because, I mean, ASU gets a bit of really bad rap for all its DEI embracing and all the leftism over there. They're good things. Like many things... Um, the the bad gets the gets, glory gets highlighted and uh and the good is over there in the corner being being hidden so we're yeah. we're shining a light yeah well that's good no it's they they need the pr for sure and in all and in i will say i yeah i've got four kids they all went to to school here in arizona to u of a to asu you're a split divided. family we are a split family and and to add to it my oldest got her undergrad at U of A, got her master's at ASU, and then got her doctorate at NAU. So we cover oh. all the schools. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, we're, we're yeah I, you know, growing up here, I, I was born here, and then we moved to Tucson in 1974. So grew up around the University of Arizona. But I think my dad was actually very, very secretly an ASU fan. Mm-hmm. Because the only time I ever saw him angry about sports was, was I think, twice. Once when uh, Frank Cush was fired. Okay. For smacking some kid on the helmet, and then they fired him. Maybe it was more than that, but that's the way it certainly was illustrated. And he thought Frank Cush was, you know, everyone loved yes. him as a coach. Legendary. And then um, I went to my first Rose Bowl between Washington, where my dad played football, University of Washington, against Michigan. I think it was 1981, and Michigan cleaned their clock. And my father was inconsolable. Aww. He was so upset. I've never, uh, other than that, I've never seen him like upset about those sports. were the two. Well, yeah. those, and so I grew up kind of like appreciating ASU. I never understood the, and I'm and appreciating Phoenix too. It, there's always that conversation Phoenix, Tucson, Tucson, Phoenix. Why do we have to come up there? Why can't you come down here? Um, and, and so now you've made that move. Yes, I have made that move. It was, you know, it was a difficult move at the time, but it's been a good move for us, been a good for, move for the family. And um, and we like it up here, but unfortunately, there's that, yeah, there's this rivalry that it's kind of strange because I don't think people in Phoenix really think about Tucson, and people in Tucson think about Phoenix. It's I, a it's a thing. I would say that that's fair, and I mean, we tore up the road for four years. My son played hockey for U of A, so we were down there all the time yeah, and had a right. great time. It was a great program. We had a fabulous time doing that, and I kind of I miss those games and I miss that time. But I, I don't miss that drive. Yeah. Um, but but I but I understand that mentality because I grew up in southern Illinois. So even today, people are like, where are you from? Well, I'm originally from Illinois. Oh, Chicago. And I'm like, no, the other Illinois. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I kind of see how that's The how, red part of the state. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Although it was interesting. It wasn't when I was oh, young. Oh, it wasn't? But it, it, but it was, but it wasn't, now. right? True, true. It was, it, it was the old Democrats. The, very true. You know, the church-going, God-fearing, country-loving Democrats yeah. of old. My, you know, when I was growing up, it was it was the whole county board was Democrats, and the township board was Democrats. My mom actually ran for office is that when I was a grown-up and oh, wow. uh, became the first woman and first Republican elected to her township board. And then later, she's and then she was elected to the county board, which used to be all Democrats, and and I love that my mom, it was my mom who did it. My dad. She was a trailblazer. She was. She is. She still, she, and she still serves on both. Does she really? Mm-hmm. That is fantastic. Yeah. Well, what brought you to Arizona? 
my husband. Oh, the, the immortal Gordon C. James. Yes, the, the, the man, the myth, the legend. He's the best. He is the best. Yeah. I'm very lucky. Um, but he grew up here. He's a, a, a native. And uh, we'd been in D.C. We started our company in D.C. And uh, as you know, in, in 92, George H.W. Bush did not win re-election. No, he did not. Um, and we were doing some work out here. We'd opened an office out, uh, out here and I was pregnant and I went, you know what? I, we're not going to live in Salem, Illinois. So let's, but I'd like for my kids to grow up around family. So let's reverse this commute and we'll live in Phoenix and you can commute back to DC. And that's what we did. Well, that's fantastic. What we do. (laughs) And then you, you both were really involved with the, with the second Bush presidency as well. Yes. Gordon traveled. He was on the road. He, he did all the advance work for them. He right? did advance, and um, I was the executive director of the campaign here. Well, in 2000, it was a victory operation, sure. and then in 04, it was the Bush Cheney operation. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, and you and you just had like a big reunion, didn't you? That was an HW reunion. That was an HW reunion. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, it was a really great. We went down to Texas A and M, and it, it was been to celebrate his hundredth birthday. His hundredth birthday. That's right. Um, they did a fantastic job. The library, I hadn't been there since since the library had first opened. It's incredible. If you have the opportunity to go, absolutely go check it out. It's really amazing. So what are the biggest differences between the two Bush libraries, would you say? Um, I mean, they're both really incredible, and they but, yeah. but they cover their, their, you know, their time. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting because they're both um, represented in each other's libraries, too, because... Yeah. Cause George W. Bush was a big part of George H. W. Bush's campaign life. And um, while I would say that George H. W. Bush tried to stay hands off, it's still very, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it, it, he, that's a small club of former presidents. Yeah, um, absolutely. But they're both, re, you know, they, they're both reflected in, in each other's libraries and they're both, they're both worth your time. I mean, I encourage anybody, if you're in a town that has a presidential library, you should go. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it, 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 although I've not, I've been to Little Rock several times. I have not stopped at the uh, William Jefferson Clinton Library. You know, I, I'd be curious to see what's and, in there. I haven't been there either. And 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 when you drive by it, it, it looks like a double wide. So I mean, that's been the biggest knock on it. Oh wow! Yeah. Well, it's just this big square, very rectangular building from the. From the side, and my my mother in law will hate me for saying that, but it's it's very true. I'm sorry, but because she's a staunch lover of the Clintons, <laughs> I will say that I, I, I think the W Library is more um, it's a, ornate's not the right word, but more um, it's SMU. It's more SMU. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. We I. When we were looking at schools for for Grace, and uh, we we stopped in there, I think twice. And I, there's always something new. There's always something interesting. It's it's funny how other presidential libraries are different than, I think the King, uh, I mean, for lack of a better term, presidential libraries, which is the Reagan Library. I mean, the Reagan Library is just on another, it's fantastic. another scale. It's fantastic because you have Air Force One. You've got all this history that's been deposited there from his his eight years and and they do so much more activism from there as well they do a lot i will say one of the things that they they opened um last week when we were in just last week that we were at texas a&m is they have the the train and so now the train is open and they have marine one um so those are both really new and, and, and a new addition and something new to see if you've already been there, go back. Yeah. The, I mean, they're always educational and there's always something new and they're always refreshing yeah. the libraries and, and it, it doesn't really matter what party you're in. You should, you should go and, you should go. and see and learn and discover. I mean, history is amazing. Yeah. It, it was, it, I will say, and, and then I'll stop comparing them, but um, it's interesting to go into uh, Bush 43 library and you see, you know, steel from the World Trade Center. Yeah. And you go into 41's library and you see a large piece of the Berlin Wall. Yeah. Um, and they're in, and, and, you know, it's just interesting to me that you walk into both of them and you have these massive pieces of, of, of history. History. 
Yeah, the, and and they they were leaders at really pivotal times. Yeah. Uh, um, you kind of have to wonder what 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 could have been if if H. W. had won his, his his second term. Yeah, history. I uh, mean, I mean, wars really kind of weared on both presidencies. Mm -hmm. You know, in, obviously both in Iraq, and and that well, that 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 confronted the electorate at that time in a really in, for a really stark. Place. I th and I think we're going to be seeing that in this election as well. I mean, in terms of what Biden is doing internationally and the failures that he's having internationally. Although yeah. with HW, there wasn't a failure. No, with, it was. And with W, his... wasn't a failure. But people, I think, just get tired of, of war. But if you remember, 41s, it was, he had 92% approval rating. Oh, I know. It was the economy. Yeah. It was the economy. And I won't use the famous line from the Clinton campaign, <laughs> but it was the economy. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and and he went back and 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 was faulted for raising taxes, which yeah. which tanked the economy. If you he bought into a bill of goods from the Senate. Well, if you, I, I will encourage this. If you go yeah. and follow the library, they there were a couple of presentations that they did that they have now made. You can you can watch them. They they carried them live, but you can you can, they stream them. You can watch them now, and they were really good and really. Interesting times of behind the scenes and things that were happening um, during the presidency with um, Secretary Gates, Secretary Card, um, sharing these stories. Governor Sununu was there. It was it was a really, um, but but I think what's really interesting in having uh, Gates and and Card having this conversation is they both were part of both administrations. Yes. So it, it's a it's a good you, you had good that, conversation that overlap for sure. Yeah. Well, let's talk local. Okay. Politics a little bit. What's your What's your assessment of this fair Senate race that that we're about to embark on? So, I'm worried. You're, uh, yes, I, I'm, 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 <laughs> rightfully so. I think I, I am worried, um, and I think that a couple of things. I think that people, when they start voting next week, um, need to think about. Not who can win a primary, but who can win a general election. And uh, they're contrary to popular belief. There are two candidates. There is a race yeah. <laughs> uh, in the primary. And people should be doing their homework and researching and, and thinking forward to November of who can win that race. And I think that's important. So, I mean, the two candidates that you're speaking of, of course, is Carrie Lake. Mm -hmm. And then you've got Sheriff Mark Lamb yes. from, from Pinal County. Who's surging, it seems like. He does seem to be surging. And and the question is, um, it's always to be good to be surging when ballots are dropping. But is it enough? And was it in time? Yeah. And that's going to be well, obviously the Carrie's question. Obviously, name ID, Her positively name ID. or negatively, is is high. Name ID is huge. Yeah. Name ID is huge. And, and Sheriff Lamb is known very well in Pinal County and in, I would say, activist circles yes and i'm not sure that that's enough he's, he's kind of carved out that identity for himself over the last several years mm -hmm. and and engaging many speaking engagements yes. across across the country for conservative groups yes and 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 trying to you know hone up on on those skills rightfully so he's and then also spoken. elevate himself for his for what he's trying to do to, to fight what is happening on the border he is he's well spoken and I don't I, you know I hadn't until maybe a couple weeks ago I stumbled upon I hadn't really ever followed the Pinal County Sheriff's social media highly recommend oh yeah I don't know if you've watched it but I have. they they do these stops and they video them and they and they show us what's happening um relative to all sorts of things um human well, smuggling drug smuggling well, just the crazy stuff that they do on i-10 yes right there in eloy which we go by if you're, you're going yes. back and forth from tucson to phoenix I you're there out of all a the perfectly time good airplane in eloy one day the what i said i jumped out of a perfectly good airplane well yes in eloy there is one there day. is that going on <laughs> and and the, and the sheriff are not going to stop you from doing that but no. but it's really interesting to see who they pull over that's just now, I, I, when I'm driving that road, I'm looking for these things yes. in, in a way that I didn't before. You know, the the, the vans with 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 you know Sonoran license plates, blacked out windows, those type of things yeah. that that obviously um, 
could be up to nefarious use. Well, what caught my attention as I watched, he was he was with a, a female officer. They'd pulled over a, a kid. I mean, it was he was a kid. Yeah. Um, and they asked him. I don't. I don't know what. I missed the beginning, so I don't know exactly why they why he was pulled over. But you know, they asked him um, why he had these. Uh, I think they were. I can't remember where they were from, but he does ask them, and he's fluent in, in Spanish. Yeah. Um, but they asked him why he had these passengers and this kid says, Oh, I just picked him up at the circle K in Marana and I'm, they needed a ride. So I just thought I'd be a nice guy. <laughs> and Sarah's like, um, are you, you how know, old are you? Let's, son? let's think about this again. You just randomly saw these people standing on the corner and, and then the, the female officer, she says, you know, we do this every day. And we know what's going on. We know that you were given a pickup spot and you, where are you going to drop them off? And then what was interesting, the sheriff says, well, are there are any other people in your car? And the kid says, no. And he says, well, do you mind popping your trunk? And he goes, no, I don't want to pop my trunk. So eventually they pop the trunk and there's yeah, three there's more people, three more two people or three more trunk. people in the trunk, yeah. which is dangerous and sad and scary. Yeah. Um, and Especially if they're children. And but, that happens quite a bit. But what amazed me, or, or what impressed me, was his a he engaged in a conver- a very friendly, respectful conversation with these people. Got him out of the trunk. Um, where are you from? But it was all in fluent Spanish, mm-hmm. which um, is impressive to me because I cannot, I can barely speak English. <laughs> um, and then, but he said, to the, but he also to this kid, he said, "You remind me of my own kids." And he said, "You lied to me." And why'd you lie to me? And the kid said, well, I thought you'd be mad at me for having people in the trunk. And he goes, well, I'm more mad that you lied to me and prolonged their time in the trunk. Yes. And I don't know. It was just, it was really, I'm not doing it justice. I just go to that page and check no, it No, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different videos, both on YouTube and just on Instagram as well, that he posts. Um, I think they have one of their deputies. They've sort of tried to make famous and what he's doing yes, the, yes. the day, like Frank or Fred or something like that. Yes. And, and I, I had never followed any of that, um, and I, quite frankly, I, I didn't really give Sheriff Lamb a chance. But the fact that he's surging, and I think also the fact something that we've talked about on the show, and I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that you probably listened to that episode, but there's there's a growing concern that Carrie Lake really does not want to win, that she is doing everything she can, much like she did in the governor's race. To lose. Well, somebody asked me about this at the beginning of the campaign, and I said, you know, after the last primary when she was running for governor, um, Kim Owens and I had an event, and we invited people that we knew hadn't voted for her. Sure. And it was a QA and a session. Ask her whatever you want. And I have to tell you, she was fantastic. She did an amazing she job. She has the skills. She has the skills, but then... You know, we leave that day, and these and these women were impressed, and they were like, "Oh, I had no idea. Where has this person been? I, I can support this person." And like two weeks later, she goes back into her, like, primary attack John McCain mode. You know. Yes. And I'm, I mean, I had a primary. I had, did a primary against John McCain when he was running for president in 2000 in Arizona. Wasn't very popular, <laughs> um, but <clears throat> he, she. Um, it was like the primary is over. It's and it's, this is a game of addition, not subtraction. You are you are echoing you know a, a common refrain on this show, and that is she is practicing the politics of subtraction, and she's doing it again. Um, I know that she's trying to reach out to a lot of people that she's alienated, but I think it's almost too late in she, many regards. I think she did start that process, but the problem is she did that after the last campaign, moving into yeah. the general. But then, and I was like, can you? Well, history repeat itself, and it seems to be. Yeah, she doesn't. Uh, she either is doing it on purpose, which is a contention of this show that she is doing it on purpose. You don't, you don't reach out, have an olive branch to somebody like a John Shattuck or or even a Sean, even a Sean Noble, and then proceed to torpedo them. You know, it's 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 disappointing. Once once once, once you feel like you have their support. And and in the last election, in the gubernatorial election, her going after the McCains, going after the Ducey, the Ducey, you know, voting contingent, which is m- vast majority of the business community, 
not willing to really meet with the Arizona Chamber, not willing to do the things that you absolutely need to do to win in the general. Um, it's Is it a novice mistake or is it on purpose? So we, can we talk about something else that sure. I, I'm intrigued by? Um, people like Carrie Lake and Abe Hamada who are endorsing people. And I'm like, well, you have never won a, a race. So why are you endorsing people? How about you just focus on your own race? Yeah. And I don't well, understand that. Well, because it's about positioning yourself. <coughs> sorry. It's all right. It's about positioning yourself to raise the most money. I it's Just from a cynic standpoint, I think it's all about clicks and coin. I think they have no intention of winning. If they had every intention of winning, they would do the things you need to do to win. And that's creating coalitions. That's, that's bringing people in. Uh, you might not agree w with some of those people. You might agree with them 80% of the time, 70% of the time, but you still need them to win. Um, broadening the coalition, bringing in independents that, that perhaps are not wouldn't take a look at you the, the last time. And that's not something I see them doing. Well, and, I, and I'll say this too. Where is the leadership from the party and from these? Well, she torpedoed the leadership from the party. Well, <laughs> in her own, in her own very Carrie Lake sort of way. Well, but, and 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 the, what we've discussed on the show is like, who's she going to torpedo next? Well, what I'm talking about though is, is this? I, I don't know. I'm sure you've seen it. This Shelby Bush lynching combo oh, this week. Yes. Where are the statements? from the party, from candidates calling that out. Yeah. Because it's not okay. And for those of you who didn't see this, this, um, this is a campaign advisor to, to Carrie Lake. Or, who is she? She Well, she's on the MCRC. She's on the MCRC. She runs a, a PAC, and she's the head of the convention delegation. That's right. And, and sh there's a recording of her saying that if she saw Stephen Richer, who's a Maricopa County recorder, that she would lynch him. And he's Jewish. And he's, yes. So that type of language within the party or within the extremes of the party is despicable. It is. And, and nobody has, has And it should be her. called out as yeah, such. Absolutely. And, and a, few, a few people have, but very few. But, but the state party is silent on this. Um, the county party is, is, in my opinion, complicit in it. Yeah. Um, and I just, I'm, I'm, that's not who we are. That's not who we, that's not who we should be putting forth as our convention leader. Um, and it disturbs me greatly. Yeah, I don't, I don't get a lot of joy in attacking other Republicans in language that is, that is inflammatory and despicable. And I don't understand why Republicans do that, I, I, especially, you know, if you want to call it the extreme right or the MAGA right or whatever else. We're not we're not creating coalitions of addition We're, we're you turn people off by that and you make people go the other way or, or not vote at all, which and, is what we've seen. And that is a concern of people staying home because they're turned off by all this. And, and to those people. Well, they they may not stay home, but they're going to look at their ballot and be like, eh. I'm going to leave this blank. And, and, and Sean did some excellent work on this where one of the, one of the reasons why Carrie Lake lost the undervote is because of the undervote. Yeah. The undervote is a real thing. And for, for people who don't speak political voting language, <laughs> political. the undervote means that you're, you're voting for the top of the ticket and then you're leaving other or, or you're voting in some races and not others. You're choosing to leave those. Or you're alone. writing your own name in, or somebody else's name, or Mickey in Mouse, because, or yeah. whatever. And that that happens. I voted for Dave Sitton, who had passed away for several years for some candidates. I yeah, Dave I did that. Sitton, I, the voice of the Wildcats. The voice of the Wildcats. God bless him and God rest his soul. But I I would do that for some things because I would be turned off by it's kind of a protest by who, vote. Yeah, it's kind of a protest thing. I was turned off by who was running. Either they had. You know, set their campaign on fire and said some really stupid things. I'm, like, I'm not going to vote for them, and I would I would put his name yeah. there. And and the whole thing is, is, and that's when you see the results. It says other. Yes. And, and sometimes the other gets a significant amount when people are turned off by the campaign. Absolutely. And and the whole thing is, we don't need to be those people, yeah. and we don't need to accept those people. What we need to do is, as as participants in in this uh, 
great experiment that is the United States of America. The greatest country on the face of the planet. At, amen. Is, but you have to show up. You have yeah. to vote. It does matter. It does count. You have to show up. Your, your just basic duty from the minute you turn 18 and you're able is to register to vote and to show up at the polls. Yeah. I mean, for heaven's sakes, we or make it so easy. You don't even have to ballot, leave your it. house. You don't have to pay for postage. No. You don't have to do it. I mean, it's easy. And, and independence, pick your ballot. Do you want to affect the Democrat primary? You don't want to affect the Republican primary, but show up. Because until we send a message and engage and get back to finding thoughtful and, and not weak thoughtful, strong, principled people that run on our platform. And we win on the, if you talk about ideas, we win. Absolutely. If you talk about policy, we win. If you talk about personality, we're not doing so great. No. So. Well, and you've been really involved with training, and educating candidates and the next generation of, of conservative um, women in the state through your uh Efforts with Doty London. Yes. So we have the Doty London. Talk to London. our listeners a little bit more about that. Yes. If, and if you. This is a passion of yours and a passion of mine too. It is, so we have a program. It's called the Doty London Excellence in Public Service Series. And the Excellence in Public Service Series is a national program. It started in Indiana. Oddly enough, it's a program for women, but it was, it's, it started with Richard Luger of Indiana, <laughs> um, who appreciated women yeah. and said, you know, you guys are the backbone of everything that's happening here. So you should have this, this program, um, and, and really was a champion of it. And we started it here, um, with the help of Christine Toretti, who's the national committee woman from Pennsylvania. She has the Anstein program. So it's the Ann Anstein excellence in public service series. There's the Luger excellence. There's the, uh, Christine Todd Whitman, there's uh, there's a multitude of them, the Joanne Davidson series in Ohio. Uh, so it's across the country, and each each state does a little bit different. But in Arizona, uh, with the Doty London program, Doty London was the first woman to ever chair, and for a long time the only woman that had ever chaired the Arizona Republican Party and was a real um, leader, a real unity-driven, but it meant business, yeah. get things done, took care of business uh, uh, woman. And... Um, She's passed, but her. Uh, but we were given permission to to name the program after her. Our applications are open right now, and by the way, it's London L O N D E N. Mm -hmm. um, so you can go to Doty D O D I E, London L O N D E N dot com. Our applications are available. They're open right now, and uh, they're due by July thirty first. Um, you can download it right from our website. Fill it out if you are interested in engaging more in the political process and in leadership, um, I encourage you to check us out, reach out to us. Um, we'll answer any questions you have. It's a, a program that lasts for about nine months, meets monthly. Uh, we have networking dinners. We have over 120 graduates in the program now. Um, and it's a really strong network of women who uh, do everything. Some have run for office. Some have been elected to office at the local, county, state level. Some have served on boards and commissions. Some have had party um, leadership roles, uh, have been campaign leaders. So um, it doesn't mean that you're going to run for office. Some people come in, they're like, I want to take this program. I want to be part of this program because I want to run for office. And then they, at the end of it, they're like, I am never running for office. <laughs> And others come in and they're like, I would never run for office. And at the end, they're like, I am running for I'm office. I'm doing it. So it's, it's a growth. Uh, well, let me ask you this. What program. are the deliverables of the program? Like what, what facilitates that type of thinking? It's not, it's not just networking. It's obviously a lot of education. It's education. So there's a reading component to it um, from conscious of a conservative to the blueprint out of uh, how the Democrats took back Colorado. Yeah. Um, because we need to learn. Um, it's Ann Rand. It's, we have a, yeah, there's a lot of reading. Oh, that's great. Um, and like what from Ann Rand? Atlas Shrugged. Atlas Shrugged. It's, 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 it's a small book. A, yeah. Just a tiny little book. Little, little, little book. Um, so there, there's reading. So um, good old fashioned libertarianism. Is there's reading, there's reading involved. Um, and also though, um, oh, help me. I always mess up the name of this book. Um, and I love it so much. Uh, Arthur Brooks, um, Heart of a Conservative? Oh. Conservative uh, Heart? Uh, I, know oh. what, I know what book you're talking about by anyway, Arthur. Arthur Brooks. Arthur's going to be here in January. 
Oh, excellent. Yeah. Um, Not at the show. We're going to try to get them on. You the should show, try. But, but uh, um, anyway, uh, so reading, but, but each month is dedicated. So you, you start out and we're really talking about the history of the party, um, what it means, what the difference is between your county, your state, your national party, the role of the party, the districts, all of that kind of, you know, a lot of background information. Um, but we go forward, we do a communications section, which includes everything from writing a letter to the editor, to giving a speech, to um, all kinds of comms. We do, um, we have someone come in that does a, a condensed campaigns 101, that's everything about how to run your campaign. We do a day of, uh, of networking and also of how to raise money and stay out of jail, because that's important. Uh, <laughs> how to raise money and stay out, stay out of jail. Stay out of jail. Um, that's my my shortened nickname for it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we do a day where we go well, to the Capitol. It's actually very apropos because a lot of candidates don't figure that out early. It's it's a problem. Yeah. And, um, and they may not go to jail, but they end up paying big fines. Yeah. And also, if you're the treasurer of a campaign, Ooh. like you are putting your name on the line. Um, yeah. You better make sure you know what you're doing. Yes. So so we talk about that compliance. Yeah. I've been asked to have that position a couple of times. I've turned it down every time. <laughs> you're a wise man. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's it's serious business. Um, and then we do, uh, we go to the Capitol for a day, and we go to the legislature, and we we sit and commit. We pick a bill. You can pick your own, you know, whatever you want. We don't tell you what to be interested in, but find a bill and sit in on committee, you know, follow it through the process. Um, and then uh, we go to D.C. and we do, and we meet up with all the other states in D.C. and have a couple of days there, um, tour the Capitol, meet with the delegation. Um, and hear from the RNC, the NRSC, the, you know, the, um, who all, in our delegation the, the... is, is most supportive. I'm, I'm curious who so, really gets behind it. So they've all been really, they have been, they, they've all been good. Um, and you know, God bless David Schweiker. He, we just had David on the show in DC last week. He, he just every, released his episode every year we show up and he gives up his evening time does Which, he do the evening tour? And he gives a tour, and he very um, also generously allows our, our friends in Pennsylvania to come with us and does just a phenomenal job, and really appreciate that. Um, you know, we've had some women go through the program, and as a result of the D.C. part, it's really changed kind of the their, their life plan. We had, we had a young woman who went through the program. We're in D.C., and she said, you know what? I want to I work here. Yeah. And she they get, she did it. She applied. They, get the fever. they do get the fever. She applied. She went back there. Yeah, she for worked. those of you who don't know what that is, it's called Potomac fever, and it's this really viral infection that happens when you walk through the <clears throat> hallowed halls of Congress, most normally, and you get infected by this idea that I can change the world. Yeah, and uh, and, and, and sometimes you can, sometimes but you can. a lot of times you just being there is is enough. I know is I've it? when I just fly into to D.C. and I. Look it's up special. at the Capitol. It's and special to fly in and you see the Washington Monument and the Jefferson Memorial and the Capitol. And, and well, it's, it's and, amazing. And, and it's, it's more so than, <laughs> than just the monuments and museums and everything. Especially if you grew up the way we did and, and loving politics and loving ideas. Every, every place you go, everything you do, everything that you're engaged in Washington, D.C. is a battle of ideas. And the fact that you could be at some random bar like off the record across the street from the white house and you run into a you might run into some cabinet secretaries there mm -hmm. and you might run into some pretty prominent white house staffers that you see on tv and you, you might engage them in a conversation that they might not appreciate at the time but they will engage you in conversation and people engage in conversations in debates all the time and what i learned about that uh, working there and 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 being there is that you have to really educate yourself every single day on what the heck is going on. It was funny. We were there one year, <clears throat> many years back, and uh, hadn't been able to get an appointment with Trent Franks. Mm. And and usually, he you know, he'd been good about it. And and so we ran into him on the street. And I uh, said, and he was like, hey. <laughs> that happens all the time. What are you doing? Street. And I'm like, hey, it's the Doty London Group. We tried to come see you. And he was like, oh come right now. <laughs> and we all walked back to his office. I mean, that's kind of, these are the things that happen, but also just standing there and thinking, you know, being in certain parts and thinking, okay, this is where this happened. And this is where this moment in history happened. Yeah. And, and it's just, I don't know, there's something about it. 
Yeah, the, the the history of our country is messy. It's but it's sacred, and, mm -hmm. and it's unlike any other history that you'll ever read about because it's. And we talked about this in, when we were in D.C. a couple weeks ago. Is it's about really the striving for that perfect union. Yes. And and our, and our country is a testament to making wrongs right and striving to make. We tend to get there eventually. We t tend to get there eventually, no matter. Sometimes it's painful. No matter what it is. Well, it's safe to say that that Carrie Lake has never, you know, graduated from the Doty London School of, of Politics. No, she has not. Yeah. Um, but we have some great women that have. Yeah. Um, Shauna Bullock. Yes. Uh, you know, as an example, um, it's interesting. Uh, Gretchen Martinez. She's going to have a race on her hands. She she does have a race on her hands. Um, Gretchen Martinez is, worked for Governor Ducey. She mm -hmm. went through our program. She is now the chief of staff for Sarah Huckabee Sanders. That's right. Um, we had uh, another woman um, who, when we were on the D.C. trip, said, I always wanted to join the Foreign Service, and I never, I just didn't, I didn't do it. I didn't think, I didn't have the, the courage to do it. Well, after the program, she did it. She's lived in India. Then they rewarded her and sent her to Barbados as a reward for, I think, being in India. Okay. Um, then she went to Oman. She learned Arabic. She uh, just finished a, a time in uh, Egypt. And she's been, she's like, she was in Oman during when we pulled out of Afghanistan. Oh and my. was, is, you know, so you can imagine some of the things that she was doing. Same, she's in Egypt and all this is going on with Hamas and Israel. And I mean, she's just had some incredible experience. She's a good person. Um, yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's no doubt about that our country right now in terms of our approach to foreign policy is pretty much a dumpster fire. It's, uh, and, and for her to be trying to, to work through that is good for her. I, I'm, I'm like thinking as you're there. Yeah, completely. So, so there are some really, um, you know, I've, I've had other people, they're running for office here locally. They're serving in the party. They are running for school board. Um, Which is incredibly important. It is. It really it's is. Incredibly important. And, and it's, it's nice to see Republicans, grassroots, grassroots Republicans especially, get more involved and, and run for school board because they're winning. They are winning. And, and uh, if there's one, probably some benefits that, that came out of the COVID lockdowns per se in terms of parents, politicians, people of faith waking up to what was going on in our public schools. And now there's a, there's a groundswell of people who want to fix it. Although I'm and always, push back against what has been happening. I'm always careful in that conversation, though. Sure. I have a daughter who's a teacher in a public <laughs> school. And sometimes I'll see things. Imagine this. I see things on the Internet about what's happening in our schools. And I send them to her. And I'm like, are you doing this? And she's like, if I want to get fired, I will do that. So do your homework. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there, there are definitely things to be concerned about. Well, I think the center point is looking at what was happening in, in Virginia and, yeah. you know, the FBI turning in parents. And, that, which was horrid. You know, and that's, could it happen here? Sure, it could, but which is why we need some, some good gatekeepers. Yeah. And the other thing is, is people need to invest in education, not because, not just because, though, that they're mad about something. Because typically that's who runs for school board. They get mad yeah. that something happened to their kid, not the kids, but not kids, their kid, that kid. Yeah, that's a and, good point. And and that's what engages a lot of people in politics. But we need to look at the greater the greater good and think about your messaging when you're running for these offices. Well, that's a nice segue to what's happening tonight in our fair country. What do you think the messaging from Donald J. Trump is going to be tonight? I know that you and your husband are not like the biggest fans of the uh, former president. However, uh, we do have two people running. We, there, we have I mean, three. There, there, there are three, three people running. There's three, and that other person, uh, RFKJ, yes. is not being allowed to participate. He's not in the he debate. Did not, he did not reach the uh, level of, uh, of excellence that he, he had sought by being on the ballot of 38 states. So but, this uh, is the... In fact, he's only going to be on a handful of states, but it's enough states that really sway this election. It, well, yeah, it'll be interesting. It's... So it's... We're political, nerdy family. Yes, you're a political, and nerdy family. So for we sure. actually, I've been around your family, and, and it's it's a lot of fun. 
we uh, we are we're rowdy. Um, we actually had tickets tonight to go to Hamilton, which I've seen before, but we had Sasha tickets. Sasha and Preston are going tomorrow. Are they? Yeah. Well, we're now going on Sunday because I was like, we can't go tonight. It's a debate. <laughs> it's a debate. <laughs> I, I called my daughter because we go with her, and I said, we. What are you guys doing this weekend? We need to change our dates. We can't. We can't go. And she's like, "Why not?" And I'm like, "It's the debate." And she's like, "Can't you record it?" And I'm like, "No, it's not the same. We have to watch the debate in real live, real time. We have to be part of the conversation." And she's. I said, get very emotional during debates. I end up debating the debates. So, Gordon. So I have to be careful. Sometimes I'll watch it later. And, or I'll watch the, or I'll listen to the analysis, and then I'll go back and I'll watch it. I watch it. I do it. things a little, or, but always I don't watch actually, and I listen. So I'll go in my car and I'll listen to it on the radio, because a lot of times it's the old Jack Kennedy, I was, Richard Nixon, Richard Nixon thing. So Richard Nixon won that debate against Jack Kennedy. But if you watched it on TV, he was sweaty, he was sick, he had a cold, yeah. he had the flu. Um, remember when George Bush looked at his watch? Yeah. I mean, do you remember? Uh, I think it was Al Gore kept during the, I don't know why they just didn't cut his mic, but, but it worked out well. He kept, <sighs> yeah, he kept, sighing he kept through sighing. the whole thing. Yeah. And I, to the point where I was in a different room, we were having a debate watch party and I went out and said, what well, is Al happening? Gore lost the debate both visually and verbally. True. Um, but it, we've had the opportunity to be involved in debates in, in sure. the past and the preparation for them and the, you know, the whole thing. Well, um, I mean, your, your husband was the advance man for, so, for the Bushes. So yeah, absolutely. Um, but so anyway, but, but I laughed because yeah. then I called my other daughter and she said, she said something about, uh, something I said, oh, tomorrow night's a debate. She goes, yeah, they talked about it a while ago. And Austin, her husband goes, well, we know what's going on at your parents tomorrow night. Yeah. I'm like, yes, that's what we do. We watch the debates. So, so you, again, you've been a part of this for a long time. Uh, you know, know that, that you're not like the biggest fans of, of the former president. However, he is debating tonight. So, and we're not really fired up about president Joe Biden and no. <laughs> at all ever. <laughs> So if if you're if you're giving debate advice to the former president, given what we've seen in the past and the things where he's succeeded and things where he's failed, what what would you get? What type of advice would you give him for tonight? Take a minute, listen, let Joe Biden be Joe Biden because everybody need you know if if you're not convinced yet, you, you know Joe Biden is Joe Biden's own worst enemy. Sure. <laughs> and let Joe Biden show himself tonight. Well, he's going to come up all <laughs> fired up. Everyone, or maybe not. I mean, who knows? We'll see. It's going to be interesting to watch President Trump because there's not going to be an audience, and he feeds off of an audience. Oh, yeah. So that'll be interesting. The fact that their mics are going to be muted during... And he's going to have hostile um, anchors in front of him. He will, but that's... I think that's always been the case. And I think think actually he feeds off of that. So that that. that, that might have to be his audience substitute. Um, I, I want to know how many times he calls Jake Tapper fake Tapper. That's what I want. That maybe we'll have a like a a drinking game. I was just going to say, <laughs> do you ever see those drinking games yeah. where okay, how many? I am the greatest, yeah. or uh, you know, all the things. I mean, you can you can come up with a list and have your own, but I don't recommend it because it could be, especially if you go to work tomorrow. <laughs> I heard some advice on Ben Shapiro's show the other day that I thought was really. Interesting. Okay, George Bush, am I boring you? So no, no, my my watch was <laughs> was you. ringing. Someone someone from a two hundred two number was trying to call me. Um, they heard us. Yes, exactly. Um, and that is not only let Joe Biden be Joe Biden, but given the amount of time they're going to be able to to have to answer the questions, there, there's going to be a time, at least an hour into it, when Joe will start to fade. There's just no doubt about it. The drugs will begin to wear off, whatever that looks like, and. For Trump, to, Trump will take all of his time to answer a question. Yes. Joe Biden will not. He'll try to just be as short and sweet as he can. What Trump needs to do is flip that on him and say, well, Joe, you have another minute left. I'm sure the American people would like to hear more of what you have to say on this issue. I don't and see Donald Trump saying that. I don't see him doing that, but it would be a great debate tactic. And allow just allowing Joe to, then he has to ad lib. And allowing, pushing Joe to, to go off script as much as he can. Now, apparently they're going to be able to have note cards. 
Okay. Or to, or or paper to take notes. Take I don't notes. think they're they're going. He's going to have note cards. They per said se. they can have no contact with their staff. Well, I mean, and and no earpieces. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. That sort um, of thing. The it it would be interesting to me to see. So do you remember kind of sixteen? Trump was a wild card for everyone. They're like, of course. What what's he going to be like as a president? And then he gave his first State of the Union, and everybody went. He can be presidential. That was tr- that was he, true. He can be. Yes. Um, it'll be interesting to me tonight to see. Do we see a glimpse of that? Do we see rally? The rally yeah, Trump. The rally yeah. Trump, or do we see presidential Trump? Or, um, you know, because if you look at policy, aside from spending, it's pretty solid on policy. Yes. I for mean. Sure. If that you taxes, know. Regu- regulatory policy, foreign policy, you can't, you you cannot debate those points. He he needs to make it about his accomplishments and about Biden's failures. And he loves and, our military. And and hammer Biden on his failures, and make it about his accomplishments. If he if he if he harps, so Biden's going to try to make it about January six and all these different things. He's going to try to do everything he can to take away from his record. And Trump has got to move it back to Joe Biden's record and his accomplishments as president. There's never been more stark, clear comparison because you have two former presidents with their accomplishments well in hand and people know what they are to compare. And I agree with you that, that if, if Trump can just not take the bait and, and Biden will try to needle him and, and push him and just keep the conversation on Joe and let him talk. I mean, he'll win. Talk about the economy. Talk about the border. Talk about our military. Because, and kind of taking us back to the beginning of our of our conversation today, when we were talking about people grow tired tired of wars yes. and of conflict. But I don't think anybody thought that was a great withdrawal from Afghanistan. No. Well, and Joe Biden's never recovered from it. No. From polling, he was up fifty four. He was, had fifty four percent approval rating. Before Afghanistan, it was horrific. and it dropped down to forty to thirty six. It's it never horrible. ever recovered because it showed how incredibly incompetent he really was. And people want competence, you know. Despite what what people think about President Trump's bluster and everything else, they want comp- competence. Um, he's got to be careful not to you know get hooked on. Oh, he, this is a he's a convicted felon, and but he still needs to make the case that the lawfare against him is being orchestrated by the by the White House. And it's it's wrong. It's it's been interesting though to watch the the difference in how the two campaigns have handled the legal issues from Trump's prosecutions to Hunter Biden. Yeah, and um, it'll be interesting to see how that comes out tonight. Yeah, I'm. I'm it's either going to be the best debate we've seen in a long time. Or it's going to be really, really boring. Or it's going to be a train wreck. One or the other. Yeah. The last one was a train wreck. The last one. Do you remember? The last one or the first one that they did? I the think one, the first one when, when Trump was still recovering. When they just talked to each other that, and Biden's yeah, like, shut that was up, the man. Fir- and that, that was the first one. That, it, okay. Where Trump came in and he interrupted him it was a horrible. bunch of times. It was horrible. And he was coming off of COVID. And so he was he was drugged up on, on stuff, too. It was and horrible. They did, and they both were. And it was... A mess. It was bad for the country. Was, so from that perspective, yeah, I hope they at least give us a de- debate that shows the best that we can show for the country and not just, you know, two bitter, angry old men. But, but, but And let's talk about that. Come on, people. Engage. <laughs> engage. Run for office. Yeah. Be better. Be. We. It's the United States of America. We have incredible people here. Let's Let's send our best. And I think our best means... Strong, principled, you can hold your own, you can battle with the best of them. I mean, politics is a blood sport. Oh, yeah. It's a context sport. And, and, and I'm all for full engagement, but I don't think you have to be a nasty person. I, I just don't. Yeah. Well, kill, kill them with kindness. I, I'm, and a smile. Well, with go. that, thank you so much for being here. It's great to see you and thank great to you. get your insights. And, and uh, Sean and I, I think, are actually going to be addressing the Doty London women, I think, yes, in September. Yes, you are. In September. We're excited. In September, and we're looking forward to that. And uh, and anytime you need us to do anything for you, 
for you all to let us know. We appreciate it. This is fun. Thanks for having me. No, thank you. And go to uh, thanks for listening. Go to dirtylondon.com and download your applications, ladies. It's just for ladies. Just for ladies. All right. God bless. Right. Thank you for listening. Thank you.